What's going on, Military Cash Flow family? And today, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. I've been asked uh, several, several times very recently, um, more so than, than, than often, is why did I join Special Forces? But at the end of it, why did I end up leaving, right? Why did I put so much time and effort and energy into building out that military career? And then why I ultimately elected to, to leave, to leave it all behind, not even go to the guard, right? But just to cut off all ties, especially after the coveted 10 year mark, right? And so today we're going to be talking about just that. So if you guys want some more of this content that you're looking for, a little bit more insight, uh, maybe our thought processes for why we selected uh, a certain paths within our career, let us know. But without further ado, let's get right to it. All right. So let's just get right into it, guys. So for, for those who have listened to some of the other podcasts, either where, where I've been on or where we talked about it, the the whole reason I joined the military off rip was to get money for college. All right. So I had actually went to college uh, on an academic scholarship and I ended up actually losing that scholarship. Right. I was out there partying too much. My grades dropped too low. I lost it. So uh, I was working simultaneously through college as well, right? Uh, I had multiple jobs, but I realized that that tuition was pretty high. So I had to figure out a way to, to pay for it. So I looked around, I did my thing, I Googled, I researched. You know, people don't know how to do that anymore. They don't know how to, to look things up, but I looked, I called people, I interviewed with people. And then I finally found out that the military had something called tuition assistance uh, through the National Guard, okay? So I made my call over there, yippee ki yay uh, went, talked to the Marines, talked to all that good stuff. And then I realized that, all right, well, we got to do a couple different tests. We got to take that ASVAB test. And from that ASVAB, what will produce is a GT score. And then they're going to tell me what job I qualify for. I'm like, man, whatever. Look, I'm just trying to get money for college. All right. No, there's no, there's at this point in my life, I'm, I'm not living to be a patriot or anything of that nature. Uh, so yeah, man, whatever I can get is cool. And then they laid out a few options in front of me and they showed the signing bonuses for some of these. I'm like, well, hell, give me that one. Give me the one with uh, the highest signing bonus. I don't care how dangerous it is or not. And guess what it was, guys? It was 88 Mike. It was a truck driver. Yeah, it was a truck driver. So I said, man, yeah, give me that. Give me that right there. So boom, signed up for that. Now, this was the crazy part, guys. I was about 19, just, just turning 19 when I signed up for the military, okay? And I got on a plane to ship off to boot camp to basic training. But guys, this was the first time in my life that I was ever on a plane. Period. You feel me? I didn't travel as a kid. I didn't I didn't go to these places um, and visit family out of state or go on vacation, family vacation. We didn't have that. Right. Came from a very impoverished background. So uh, this is the first time I was ever on a plane. And. I'm like, all right, this is kind of cool. You know, a little nervous on the plane. We get there, boom, I'm starting to meet people from all over the place, right? They start teaching us how to shoot, move, communicate, whatever. It's all basic training, right? Then we go to the job training, which was uh, in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, Lost in the Woods, Missouri. And we get out there and I mean, now I've traveled to two different states because I've never traveled outside of Texas either, right? Two different states, two different plane trips. Right. I'm, I'm playing with these big trucks, these big machines. I'm like, man, this is kind of cool. So we get back to college campus and I'm like, all right, because I'm in the guard. And I said, OK, well, uh, we're doing this thing. What else is available? Uh oh, I now I hear about something called ROTC. And I go interview them. I'm like, yo, what's this about? Well, hey, look, you can come work with us. We're going to train you up, send you out to all these training camps. And then if you're doing well, you know, uh, we'll give you a scholarship essentially to pay for everything. And then we'll get you to commission as an officer. So I said, man, this is this sounds kind of cool to me. Let's give it a try. Lo and behold, I played around with that for a little bit. And my first year ever in the military, in the guard at that, as an 88 Mike, I not only traveled to two or three different states, I was already airborne qualified because I was one of the top PT studs, you know, as a young guy, airborne and air assault in less than 12 months. So at this point in time in my life, I'm like, man, this is 
the coolest thing that I've done. You know, you're played sports in high school, cool, but I never really traveled. Had my friends, you know, acted a fool in college and in high school, yeah, yeah. But this was like some really high speed stuff, right? So I sat back and I evaluated my options and I said, okay, I'm about to graduate. Um, I can choose to commission, right? I can go that route and I'll have a degree. I can become an officer. I can pursue a career in the civilian world. I was studying business. So, I mean, God knows what I would have done there, right? I could have been a manager somewhere, manager at Target or maybe pursued something higher. Or I can find something that is extremely challenging that will welcome me with open arms, right? Those are the three options that I was kind of sitting down and, and evaluating. And I thought about it long and hard. And I really resonated with the idea of using this next few years to build out on life experiences. So knowing that I wanted to focus on life experiences, uh, I had to think about what, what kind of options or what my three options would really represent in that, in that regard. So yeah, like a commission as an officer, period. Let's put it like this. I looked at civilian versus army and I realized right away that the army, the military was going to be able to provide me ample opportunities to learn new skill sets and travel to places and pay me the entire time to do it. So as a young kid coming out, making sure I didn't have any college debt, things of that nature, I'm like, hey, yes, this is going to be a life experience for me, but understand it's a great financial decision as well, because I'm going to be in a place where I got guaranteed income and I'm doing all of these things, all of these experiences for free, right? Or, or being paid to do it, which is even better than free, right? So I said, okay, I'm definitely going to go the military route. I made that decision there. Now I laid out the option of going uh, officer or trying something difficult. Now, when I looked into the military's difficult roles as enlisted versus officer, I realized a couple of different things changed. One, as an officer, your career path is a little bit more defined for you. You have to do a certain amount of years before you can apply for certain positions. Um, you have to travel through certain positions before you can qualify uh, for the next rank and things of that nature. Now, with that being said, it's very similar in the enlisted side, but that wasn't exposed to me in the beginning. So as I was looking on the enlisted side, I realized that the enlisted soldier is a little bit more of the grunt for a lack of better words, right? We're the ones actually doing a lot of the work while the officer side of the house is making a lot of the executive decisions. Now, again, this is loosely translated. All my enlisted folks, y'all probably feel me. Our officers don't do shit. I work for a living. Yeah, got it, got it, got to calm it down, right? But nonetheless, I had to make that decision. I said, yeah, I can be this executive decision maker or I can be the person actually doing it. And I said, which one is going to be a little bit more uh, experience filled, if you will, right now, hindsight being 2020, it's two different, they're very experience filled uh, career paths, just a little bit different sides of the spectrum. So lo and behold, I started looking at it and I wanted to be a ranger at first. Cool. I was going to do that thing. And then I realized that because of the way that uh, my bank account was set up, no, 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 because of the way that I had already joined and already served um, in the guard for a year, whatever the case is, I wasn't going to be able to transfer right into the RASP program as easily as I would have been able to go straight to uh, selection, right? The selection and assessment program with uh, uh, becoming a Green Beret or Special Forces. Now, at the time, I didn't know what the hell Green Berets were. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not like I grew up knowing what, one, what the military was or what each MOS and each field was. I just knew at that point in time, I want to do something that was very challenging. And Rangers was my first choice just because that's what I knew. And then I found and discovered uh, Special Forces. So as I dug in and did more research, what I found out was that uh, the, the Green Beret field, the U.S. Army Special Forces field, is really training somebody to be a diplomat. And what do I mean by that? They actually gave you cultural training language training. They taught you how to handle yourself in different situations in different environments, how to survive in different environments. And when I looked at the two opportunities, I said, I mean, this is a hands down decision for me. Yes, I can, you know, wreck it with the best of them out there. And Rangers are no joke. Don't get it twisted. Mad respect uh, for the Ranger Regiment. But I could have went over there and been a Ranger, right? And did some high speed stuff or 
I can be trained by the military to be a standalone, independent, diplomatic warfighter, right? This is this is me at 19 years old going through these thoughts, right? That's not me as as me as today, right? This was a decade, over a decade ago. That I was thinking in my head, man, I can do all of this stuff and be paid to do it. Boom, easy, easy decision for me at that point in time. So I joined, simple as that. I joined, I went to selection. I knew that the worst case scenario for me was if I didn't make it uh, through selection, that I could still pursue uh, the officer route, right? Because I still had my degree. I could go to OCS. I could do a whole bunch of other stuff. So I had a couple backup plans already kind of lined up. But, uh, you know, I said, hey, I'm going to give it everything I got because this is what I really want to do in life. Go to selection. Lo and behold, thankfully, I was selected my first round in. I don't know what they saw on me, but hey, they took it. Um, and then we started the Q course. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Special Forces Qualification course, it is a, at the time that I went through it, it was a two-year pipeline. They've drastically reduced it now uh, because of the need of personnel. Uh, but it took me two years, right? Um, luckily, I didn't fail any portions of the course. I was able to get through it, knocked it out, yippee ki -yay. And then I got to the teams, all right? And this is where the dynamic for me really started to shift. So as a young, naive man, boy, right? I was a man, but nonetheless, young and naive, I had what, what I envisioned was going to be my military career, right? I was always physically capable, uh, the 300 plus PT stud, all that good stuff, uh, shot expert, all that good stuff, you know, fine and dandy. Um, I always felt that I was always going to be ahead of the curve when it comes to my military progression, because that's what I saw. That's what I knew. Mind you, being an ADA Mike in the National Guard is significantly different than being uh, a Green Beret, right? The quality of personnel that you're around, and again, no disrespect to ADA Mikes, I was there, there are some great people there, but understand that the selection process, the qualification course, that entire proving ground of over two years is required before you even dawn the green beret so the quality of individuals that are in the green beret pool they're all physically fit they're all slightly in, you know more intelligent they're all have these skill sets that uh are, are unique right that are above norm so my whole thought process of me being able to stand out as an individual uh was quickly taken away and not taken away but quickly humbled and i realized that okay I have a long way to go to prove my worth in this community. All right. And so that's where I, that's the journey. That's where it started from there. So I began pursuing more training, right? I, I went to, to Ranger school. I actually went to Ranger school after I was a uh, uh, special forces because I understood the impact of that on my military career. Uh, you know, made sure I attended all the training events, all the additional education requirements, all everything I could to stand out from the crowd. I made sure my PT was top notch. And ultimately for me, the, the, the point where the decision started to shift was that I had a series of deployments that didn't work out, again, the way that I imagined. So uh, to be completely candid, when we look at war, when we look at combat, let's we Hollywood has done a great job of romanticizing it and making it seem very sexy. But to be quite honest, it's not. It's not that sexy, right? And it's not a matter of fear and a matter of pride. It's a matter of the sacrifice that you put up with the people that you're around. It's a matter of the people that you begin to lose in your life that you've created close relationships with. It's a matter of being able to absorb everything that you experience and not necessarily having an outlet or a way to explain it um, to individuals. That's the big stuff there um, that we have to be aware of, okay? So as all of these things started to, to, to kind of affect me a little bit differently, I started realizing that, okay, I want to be in control of my career. If, if understanding that these external influences are going to impact me in many different ways, I want to make sure that I can make the best out of this experience still moving forward. So what does that look like? It looks like me getting the assignments that I want. It looks like me getting um, the positions that I want, the opportunities, the schools, the training, the so forth. Well, lo and behold, 
Although the grass may be greener, the grass is still grass. It's still the army. So with it still being the same old, same old, it meant that I still had to be in a certain position. Um, I had to be in a certain rank, right? Uh, for a certain time period before I ever qualified for the next step, right? It still meant that there was people that had seniority because they were simply there longer. It still meant that, you know, somebody can be placed into a position of leadership because they outlasted, right? Because they stayed longer than their competitors. It could be still a, a fact that just because somebody had a personal relationship with somebody who was above them, then they could have had higher marks on their evaluations, therefore putting them into the position, right? It's still the military. Now, I'm not here to, to bash any portion of the military or anything of that nature, but what it really opened up my eyes to is that it is still a political system where you are, to be quite transparent, you're a pawn. Right. You're a pawn in the big scheme of things. Now you can attempt to uh, move your, your career in whatever trajectory you want, but it, let's just say hypothetically that in a situation where leadership does not want you to move forward, there's not much you can do because typically they're the ones that have to sign off on your approval to go to the training, to get that new assignment, to go over here and so forth and so on. So once I kind of understood that as a holistic picture, I realized that, you know, I originally joined for the experience, not for the money, not for the clout, not for anything else, for the experience. At this point in time in my life, my experience requirements or desires have been met. Now, let's not get it twisted. There are several things that I wish I still could have accomplished in the military, but I understood in the grand scheme of thing, time is the most valuable thing. I wasn't worried about retirement, you know, spending an additional 10 years for retirement because after educating myself on finances, I realized that I can create that in far less time than 10 years. I can do that in two years, three years, four years. And in the meantime, I can also experience many other things in life without having that confinement of the military. So ultimately, I, I, I love the time that I was in. I loved the people that I served with. I would not trade any of that experience for the world. It allowed me to see the world in a whole new light. It taught me skills like different languages, different cultural uh, experiences and exposures. It positions very highly coveted positions in, in some really outstanding places across the world. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. I really wouldn't. But it was my time to hang the hat up. It was my time to move on to the next portion of my life, the next experience. And now it's, it's a beautiful opportunity where now I'm a part of the military cash flow family. And, you know, I'm able to share this type of insight with you guys. So what I will say is for everybody out there looking for their MOS is to not only think in the short term, but think a little bit further in life. What do you want those experiences that you go through, the skill sets that you learn? How do you want it to impact your life in the future? How do you want it to, uh, uh, what skill sets is it that you want to be able to transfer over? What lessons do you want to learn? Um, all that kind of uh, stuff as you're deciding which MOS may be the best one for you. But that's a little bit of inside of why I originally joined and then why I ultimately left. And hopefully you guys uh, got a little bit more of the inside of the inner workings of Mike G, right? I'm like, what am I thinking? And hopefully, though, uh, by me verbalizing that for some of you guys who may feel like you're, you're ready to make that transition out, but you haven't thought, is it the right decision or not? Hopefully something that I said there can just gave you a little bit more food for thought. And for those who are looking to join, same thing there. So if you guys enjoy the content, go ahead, let me know, leave some comments below. If you guys want to hear some more stories, whatever, Hey, I'm an open book. Let me know in the comments below, go ahead, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And until next time, this is Mike Glassby signing off.